It's good to be here. Good to see all your smiling faces. It's wonderful to look out at a congregation that looks full of energy and enthusiasm. Looking forward to hearing from the Word. This week's Parsha is Parsha Shoftim, and it is my absolute favorite Parsha of all Parshas all year long. It begins with the words, Judges and officers shall you appoint Shoftim, Veshoftrim. Uh, and it, it lists out the instructions for judges. Now, I want to point out, I'm going to jump through a lot of verses today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them and look uh, at what's going on. Because this, while I love all the Parshot, this is a special one because there is a lot of information a lot of symbolism of Messiah, a lot of instructions for us. And uh, so I want to go through. First of all, it starts with judges and officers. You should appoint your gates, which the Lord your God gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert judgment. You shall not respect persons nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Verse 20 says... Justice, only justice shall you pursue, pursue, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God gives. Now, I want to let you know that there's the word in Hebrew at the beginning of verse 20 is sedek, sedek, which is translated justice, justice in, in your Bibles. But it comes from the word for righteousness, not the word mishpat, which is the the word for, uh, for justice or judgment. You know, in the Torah we have the judgments of God, the mishpatim. So this is a variant and it's a change that's purposeful in the scripture because it is impossible for human beings to judge righteously on their own judgment. It is impossible for us to judge righteously outside of God's judgment. And so it doesn't just say appoint justices and let them judge and don't you take bribes and don't uh, respect persons, but it uses the word for righteousness telling us that it's beyond our ability because we know that none of us are righteous, not one of us. And so in order for righteous judgment to be made, it has to be judged according to the word of Elohim, the word of God. Now, I also want to point out that contrary to modern teaching, we are to judge. You know, nowadays, if somebody says something, the immediate response is, believers aren't supposed to judge. You know, judge not that you be not judged. People know that verse. Drunks in bars know that verse. Streetwalkers know that verse. Alcoholics know that verse. Judge not that you be not judged. They, They leave out all of the verses that tell us to judge. That tell us to be righteous in our judgment, to call out sin when we see it and in a loving and righteous way, not demeaning or condemning, but convicting with the power and spirit of the Ruach HaKodesh, we have to be able to determine what's righteous and unrighteous, or else He wouldn't have given us a book that tells us what's righteous and what's unrighteous. When I look at certain foods, I know what's kosher and what's unkosher, based upon what the Bible says. It's not my judgment. It's His judgment. We're not supposed to be legalistic, but I guarantee you this, our Creator, the God of the universe, our Elohim is is a legalist. He is. He gave us His Word and says, this is the Word you will abide to. And I'm going to hold you accountable to this Word. Amen? It says, justice, only justice you shall pursue that you might live and inherit the land which the Lord your God gives you. We don't pay attention to this, 
but there is a direct relationship between life and righteous judgment and justice in the community. It's important that we understand, and I said this yesterday in passing, and it, 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 you know, sometimes you say something and you go, wow, where did that come from? So then you write it down and share it with other people so they think you're intelligent. But the, I, I said, we cannot, as believers, either be selective in our forgiveness or selective in our outrage. We can't choose what sin we're going to get more upset about. And we can't choose what sins we're going to forgive when somebody asks us to forgive them. If somebody comes to you and asks for your forgiveness, you don't have the right to be unforgiving. My wife said to say that, so if it didn't click with you, you can blame her later. It says, Justice, only justice shall you pursue, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God gives you. And it immediately goes from justice to you shall not plant an asherah of any tree near the altar of the Lord your God, which you shall make. God equates unrighteous justice and judgment with idolatry. When we judge people unrighteously, it is equal to idolatry. It goes on to say, You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God any bull or sheep where there's a blemish or anything evil, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, as I go through, where am I? In the Bible. This is, should be chapter... Uh, 19.1, I believe, isn't it? 17.1. I knew it had a line that, that, that way and that way I missed the round part. I'm sorry. It says, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your... That's right, it was 16.18, not 18.16. Uh, Hebrew dyslexia. I learned to read Hebrew before I learned to read English. It says, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord any, uh, your God any bull or sheep where there's any blemish or anything evil... For that is an abomination to the Lord. Now this is, by the way, a direct symbol and reference to the Messiah who was found a perfect sacrifice. He was no blemish and nothing was found wanting in him. It goes on, if there is found among you inside your gates, which the Lord your God gives you a man or a woman who has done wickedness in the sight of the Lord your God, Yep, tradition, tradition. If there is found among you inside out of your gates which your Lord your God gives you, man or woman who has done wickedness in the sight of the Lord, your God in transgression of his covenant, and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun, the moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded, it is told you, and you heard it, heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it's true. And the thing is certain that such abomination is done in Israel. You shall bring forth that man or that woman which has committed that wickedness, uh, that wicked thing to your gate. And that man or that woman shall, uh, and, and that man or that woman and shall stone them with stones till they die. And I want to stop there for a minute. Because if the leaders of Israel that arrested Yeshua had actually believed the charges that they brought against him, they would have followed these verses. One of the ways we know it was political and not faith is that they brought him to be tried by the Romans and executed by the Romans. Because there was nothing that stopped the Jews in Israel 
from religious execution by stoning. We know it happened because Paul got stoned. Stephen got stoned. Matter of fact, a whole bunch of the early believers were stoned. That's why so many believer, uh, Jews became believers in the 60s. It was a misreading of the text. Anyhow, if they had been righteously judging, he would have been tried under this commandment and he would have been stoned instead of being taken to Rome as a rebel against Rome, which is what the Romans ended up convicting him of, ultimately goes on, verse 6, By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he who deserves to be put to death, by, uh, he who deserves death be put to death, but by the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And I want to point out something, and I've said this before, and if you've heard it before, it's okay. There are people here that have not heard it. When Yeshua was brought the woman in the very act of adultery, and look, I understand that if she was in the very act of adultery, there was a man present at some time who was not brought with her to Yeshua. But the, man, the woman was brought to Yeshua, and then Yeshua uh, said, you know, writes on the ground, and, and the people, starting with the oldest and going to the youngest, all walk away, and he's left there with the woman. And... He says to her, where are your accusers? He's referring to this passage. He says, where are your accusers? He says, they're, they're all gone. He said, and neither do I accuse you. Why? Because it would have been a violation of the Torah. Because you had to have two or three witnesses and everybody had left except her and Yeshua. This was not Yeshua showing that grace overcame the Torah. Or that the law was done away with by love. Or any of the things that you might hear spouted around the globe. Yeshua was keeping Torah precisely. People wonder, what did he write in the ground? I don't know. I really don't. But I think it could have been, where's the man? Because the truth is, he says, who, he who is without sin cast the first. And every one of them violated the Torah by not bringing the man with the woman. So it disqualified any of them from saying they were without sin. That day, it didn't have to go back to, have you ever committed a sin in your life? By not bringing the man, they violated the very commandment that they were accusing her of. And all Yeshua could have done to continue to be Torah observant was to say, go and sin no more. Now listen, it's important. He didn't just say, go. If he had done away, with the, done away with the Torah, he would have just said, neither do I condemn thee. Go home. But he says, go and sin no more. And the scripture tells us that sin is the transgression of the Torah. He wasn't violating Torah. He wasn't doing away with Torah. He wasn't changing Torah. He was proclaiming Torah. Amen. Amen. It says, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first upon him to put him to death. And again, the witnesses had to be the first ones that participated in this execution. And the way this was done, contrary to movies and things that we see today, is they were brought to the, the accused person after conviction was brought to a cliff. And they were thrown off the cliff. And then the... Accusers would throw a large rock down on top of them. 
being caught between a rock and a hard place. That's where it comes from. And then they would walk down and check to see if the person was dead. And if they weren't dead, someone else would throw another large rock down. And that would keep going on until death came. The hands of the witnesses had to be the first one to put their hands on them. It was they pushed over. You had to listen. If you're the one making the accusation and you're the one that's going to participate in the execution, it's very serious and it mean, makes it to where the person, there's more um, justice because people don't just pretend things if you're the one that's going to have to carry out the execution. You know, it's not like just accusing somebody of something and the police come arrest them and throw them in jail and you never see them again. If you're the one that has to do the judgment, it changes. It says, afterwards, and and afterwards the hands of the people, so you shall put the evil away from among you. God considers sin evil. And something that needs to be separated and put away from us. If there arises a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between plague and plague, being matters of controversy inside your gates, I want to post that verse somewhere, like in big writing, because we don't ever have any controversies or things around. Messianic Judaism is bereft of controversy. There's just none around. It says, uh, then... uh, it says, inside your gates, then you sh- shall you arise and get to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. And you shall come to the priests and Levites, to, to the judge, who shall in those days and inquire, who, who shall be in those days and inquire, and they shall declare to you the sentence of the judgment. And you shall do according to the sentence which they of the place which the Lord shall choose shall declare to you. And you shall take care to do according to all they inform you. According to the sentence of the Torah, which they shall teach you, according to the judgment that they shall tell you, <coughs> you shall do, and you shall not decline from the sentence which they shall declare to you, to the right or to the left. And the man who will act presumptuously and will not listen to the priest who stands to minister before, there before the Lord, <coughs> your God, or to judge, that man shall die, and you shall put away the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and no more do presumptuously. One of the most frustrating things for any leader is to have people come up to them and say, I need your help and your wisdom and your advice. And then the leader sits down and goes over everything and all the information and and then gives advice and counsel and the person just totally ignores it. In the scripture, that person who ignored it was to be cast out of the camp, to be separated. Presumption. I don't think you're right. Because that person shall die. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that for all of you. But understand, when God established things in Israel, he was serious about the authority and the structure that he put in place. And I don't think he's any less serious today about authority and structure that he puts in place. It says, when you come to the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you shall possess it, live in it, and shall say... I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me. You shall set him, uh, set him king over you whom the Lord your God shall choose. One from among your brothers shall you set the king over you. And you may not set a stranger over you who is not your brother. Now I just want to say this is another prophetic verse about the Messiah. That he would be born of Israel and would be their king. It also talks about the actual physical kings. Remember, God said, I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. And then the next sentence, he says, but when you have a king, this is a retelling of that. 
And when he goes on, he says this. This is what kings are not supposed to do. He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end, so that, uh, that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said to you, you shall, not, shall henceforth return no more that way. Why horses? Horses had to do with wealth. It had to do with uh, armies. By the way, all of the things we're going to talk about with the king here in this section have to do with unbelief and doubt in God's power and ability to be God, to be our king. And understanding that the king of Israel was to be a, a servant king to God and a leader of the people, but not sovereign over all things like the kings of the world who thought they were actually the gods of their land. But he says, you shall not multiply horses to yourself. Goes on to say, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, nor shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sits upon the throne that he shall write for himself a copy of the Torah in a book from which uh, is before the priests and Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, and he shall learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes to do that. Now, I want to point out who's the most famous king of Israel? Solomon. Right? Solomon. Uh, Solomon, we have absolutely no record of him ever writing the Torah. But we do have record of him gathering horses. We have record of him sending people to Egypt. We have record of him getting, what did it say, don't gather wives? There it is. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. <clears throat> and we have record of him gathering silver and gold and riches. Matter of fact, we talk about the glory of Solomon's temple. But if you read the text of the Bible, you'll find that Solomon's house was at least one and a half times the size of the temple. His personal house was bigger and more ornate than the temple he built for God. So Solomon did everything he was told not to and didn't do the one thing he was told to do. But it's okay, there's grace. That his heart not be lifted up above his brothers and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right or the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Solomon's rebellion against God brought the division of Israel into two different lands and ultimately led to the dispersion of Israel. All because Israel wanted a king, and that king, though he was the wisest of all men, rebelled against God. Why? Because even the wisest of us, without the Spirit of God, is unwise and can be led into sin. And for reasons, we know the reason Solomon married some of the women he married. It was peace treaties with the land around him. It was to keep Israel strong. It was all of those reasons seem good from an earthly perspective. But from a faith perspective, it takes God, God out of the equation and inserts man in God's place. That's very dangerous. Goes on. Another 45, 50 minutes will be done. The priests and Levites and all the tribe of, Israel, of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel, for they shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brothers, and the Lord is, for the Lord is their inheritance, as he said to them. And this shall be the priests do from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep. And they shall give it to the priest, the shoulder, the two cheeks, and the stomach. i got to say, I don't know that I've ate cheek. 
I was asked which cheeks. The first fruit of all your grain, your wine, and your oil, the first of the fleece of your sheep shall you give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. And if a Levite comes from any of your gates out of all Israel, where he sojourns and comes with all the desire of his mind to choose the place which the Lord shall choose, he, then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brothers the Levites do, who stand before the Lord. They shall have equal portions to eat, besides that which comes from the sale of his patrimony. Then you shall come into the land. Now, by the way, how many of you actually read the partial? Okay, I know at least two of you did because I got phone calls from at least two of you that said, Rabbi, what is this patrimony thing? What is this inheritance thing? It said right at the beginning he doesn't get an inheritance and now it's saying he can, uh, can have besides which comes from the sale of his inheritance. What you have to remember is that Levites did not get an inheritance of the land. The land at the end of 50 years, whatever land belonged to your family went back to you. But that did not stop the Levites from investing during that 50 year period. And so let's say Ivan, well, let's not use Ivan. Let's say, let's say Robert is, uh, is a Levite. And, uh, you know, he's doing okay. And people, are, you know, he's got his gets from what he's getting. And somebody comes up to him and says, look, I'm broke and I need some help. Can you buy part of my land? And if Robert had the money, he could buy the land. And it would be his up until the time of Jubilee when the land would all go back. And then he could reap the rewards and benefits of that land for whatever the remaining time is. So... Robert has that land, and and uh, then something happens to Robert. And Robert's son now has the land. Robert's son's a Levite, and uh, but he's supposed to go minister somewhere else. He still gets the profits from that land until Jubilee. That's what this is talking about. So just to help explain. That goes, and when it comes into the land the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of the nation. There shall not be found among you one who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who uses divination, or a soothsayer, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a medium, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, because of these abominations the Lord your God drives them out for, before you. Uh, you shall be perfect with the Lord your God. Now, all of these things are things that we need to be aware of. And they're all things that we were, that the Israelites were told not to adapt from the people around them. And we need to be careful we don't do the same thing. Because there is witches and divination and soothsaying and necromancers and all this stuff is still active today. And we need to be aware of it. Now, some of them are really bad at it. Like a few years ago, there was the Psychic Friends Network. Everybody remember Dion Warwick and the Psychic Friends Network? Don't you think they would have known they were going bankrupt before they did? <laughs> I mean, they're really bad at it, but they're involved in it. We need to understand that we need to not be involved with it at all. There is a clear line between witchcraft and sorcery and demonology and righteousness. And the Lord did not play when it came to that. It says, for these nations which you shall possess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. Uh, but for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord your God will raise to you a prophet from the midst of your brother's like me to whom you shall listen. By the way, that's another prophecy of Yeshua. The prophet that would be raised up. That's when the, the John says, are you the one? He's talking about, are you the prophet that Moses said was going to come that was like him? Why? What makes Moses different than all other prophets? 
Moses not only heard the Lord, but saw the Lord. All the other prophets just heard him. They may have seen images, but they didn't see him one-on-one, face-to-face. Moses did. And so Yeshua is a prophet uh, from um, your brothers like me, according to all that you desire of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see his great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said, They have spoken that well, uh, they have well spoken that they have spoken, and I will raise them a prophet from among their brothers like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak to them in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. The Lord was really serious about this stuff. By the way, the scripture goes on to say... That if you give to support a false prophet, you will reap the judgment of that false prophet. We need to be careful where we send donations to. Where we support what we do. Because if they're teaching false prophecy, there is a judgment coming on them. And if we support that judgment, I mean that prophecy, that ministry... We will reap the judgment along with them. This goes on and on. Now I want to point out something in closing. And this will be my first close. When we look at things in the scripture. There's a reason the scripture is laid out the way it is. God is not a God of happenstance. He's a God of order. And he's contrasting. Yeshua. And righteous prophecy with false prophecy. And making it very clear there's only one truth. And listen, we can play around all we want to. But the truth is there's only one way to God. There's only one way to redemption and salvation. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way to reap Redemption, and that's through the atoning blood of the Messiah. There's only one way to be regenerated through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. There aren't multiple ways and multiple roads that lead to those things. Now, I will say this. All roads lead to heaven. And everybody's going to be there with the Lord. They're just not all staying there. Everybody's going to stand before the Lord. The Lord's going to judge them. And He's either going to say, enter in or depart from me. But if you want to enter in, there's only one truth. There's only one way. And all of this nonsense that we can, why can't we all just get along? You know, the God of Islam is the same God of the Bible, is the same God of the Jews, is the same, is nonsense. And it's contrary to what this says. Because Muhammad is not a prophet. Well, that's not true. If he is, he's a false prophet. And we cannot align ourselves with that. Period. Or any of the other hocus pocus stuff of the world. We have to draw a straight line. And we have to be on God's side. That's why Abraham became an Ivri. One who crossed over. And if you're children of Abraham, you have to make, in order to be children of Abraham, you have to make the same line cross over. You have to be on God's side of the line. There's no other way to look at it. Within this Parsha, and I don't have time to go through the whole thing, there's so much more. We have the cities of refuge. One of my favorite things about the cities of refuge is the scripture says That the cities of refuge were there so that if somebody accidentally killed somebody, you know, it actually gives an example for us. You know, well, what's that mean? Well, the Lord said, well, I knew you were going to ask that. So let me tell you, if you're using an axe and the head of the axe flies off and it hits one of your friends and kills him, you didn't intend to do that. So you can run to the city of refuge and you stay there and the uh, family of the person you killed can't come and avenge you. They can't come kill you. 
It goes on to say that if you purposely kill somebody and you run to the city of refuge, the people from the city, the elders are supposed to take you out of the city and give you to the avenger so he can kill you. The really cool thing about the cities of refuge, a really cool thing, (laughs) is that those that were in there for killing somebody but not murdering somebody (laughs) stayed there until the death of the high priest. And the Torah says that with the death of the high priest, those people get atonement. It's the clearest place. Judaism today says that we don't get atonement when a priest dies. We don't get atonement when somebody dies. The only atonement we get comes through good works and, and following the Torah and do it. And, and we, we don't do that. But the scripture clearly gives us a symbolic foreshadow that says when you're in that place, You're a sinner. You realize you sinned. You killed somebody. You go into the place of redemption or refuge. 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 And you stay there until the high priest's death. And with the death of the high priest, you are released from the city. And nobody can ever accuse you of the sin that you went in for again. Listen. Every one of us. Every one of us. Sinned. All of us were born in sin. We were guilty of sin. But we were innocent because we didn't do it. We born babies. There's a little bitty baby. Where is she? Susan? There's a baby in there. Little bitty baby. He's too old. I pulled out my pocket knife, but I missed by a couple weeks. Bad Jewish jokes. Little bitty baby was born in sin. Shaped in an iniquity. He was in a place of refuge. Waiting for the high priest to die so that he'd be forgiven of all that sin. When Yeshua died, he was that high priest. And he freed us from all accusations of the avenger, of the adversary, of the one that wants to destroy us and kill us. He has no claim to you and I in any way Because the high priest died and we were set free to receive our inheritance once again. Full and free. And if that doesn't give you a reason to rejoice, you need chocolate. Just say, let's all stand. I want to mention there were five cities of refuge altogether. Three of them were in Israel. Two were outside Israel. The three in Israel are the ones that this is being talked about. Because he says when you go in the land, you'll establish these cities. And number three has to do with new birth, resurrection. It has to do with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It has to do with the fullness of Israel, the Kohanim, the Levites, and the regular Israelites. It has to do with the unique nature of God. All of that points to these cities and all of it points to the one day when the high priest would give his life so that we could be set free. And we need to be excited about that deliverance because now we're no longer trapped but are free to receive all of our inheritance. Amen.